what I want to talk to you about today is Rare Disease 101. And this is a series we're going to do. We're very grateful to Foundation Ibsen, who is funding this series, and the National Press Club, who is hosting us, our wonderful um, moderator, uh, Dr. Moira Gunn, and thank you for all coming today. So I want to give you some background on rare disease. And there we go. We'll fix that in post. <laughs> so what is a rare disease? One good definition is it's all those other diseases that you never really quite know what they are. Uh, they're not very common, things like that. But there are actually some definitions out there in the population. In the United States, we use the Orphan Drug Act definition from 1983, which says fewer than 200,000 patients in the United States. As you can imagine, as the U.S. population has grown, that's actually made the incidence a little bit lower with these diseases as we've gone on. A more commonly used definition in Europe uh, and a couple of other countries is one in 2,000. Uh, so that means between the U.S. and Europe, there's probably about 40 to 50 million patients with a rare disease of some form. Uh, in Western Australia, they use the same definition, and they actually track they're in their healthcare system, and they see people coming in with rare disease diagnosis between 2 and 5 percent, and actually spend about 10 percent of their annual budget on rare disease health care. My definition is a disease that's uncommon enough where a practicing physician would not really be expected to be familiar with it. In other words, they might have heard the name somewhere, they might have seen it in an article or something, but it's not something they would encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. So rare disease is kind of that other category that usually is the largest category in any survey, but the individual responses are uncommon. All right, how much has this field grown? Well, I had a lot of fun being part of the Human Genome Project back in the 1990s. And when we started, we could identify a few dozen diseases. Over time, as we finished the Human Genome Project and the draft sequence in uh, 2000, we started picking up. And the technology improved for sequencing. And the rate of growth is such that we now identify over 10,000 different genetically encoded rare diseases. So that makes it certainly the largest group of conditions of any field of medicine. If you start doing the math on that, you're looking at 7 to 10 new diseases a week described since 2020. These are not new diseases in the population. It's just we've taken things we couldn't diagnose before, and we found ways to diagnose them. And so there's a ton of new information. But imagine you're in a field of medicine where every week, there's seven new conditions. So while we're doing this talk right here, there's two new diseases I don't know about that got described that I'm going to have to make sure and learn something about um, as we're going forward. So huge growth in this field, which makes it very different for most fields of medicine. In most fields, you expect to go to a physician and them to be an expert on everything in that field. You know, if you go to a surgeon, you expect him to know everything about the area he's operating on a gastroenterologist, everything about the liver. If you come see me, it's like, sorry, I'm out of date. Why? Well, I missed last week, so I'm seven diseases behind, or 14, or whatever. We use informatics more than any other field of medicine. We have to, because the pace of growth, and just imagine the point of trying to make um, treatment protocols for these. Every time you've got a new disease, and when you turn around. My hypothesis is that rare disease is a unique field of medicine that has different rules, different statistical structures, different patient populations, and the way we think about very common diseases does not always apply to rare disease. So think about it this way. These are typically genetic conditions. That means their lifespan. The patient is born with the condition. They'll usually have it till the day they die. Um, the evidence is based on very small numbers of patients. We are used to studies that have hundreds of thousands of patients in them, and yet for rare disease, we may only have two, three, four, five patients on which to draw experience. And given the genetic heterogeneity, because the genetic changes are not all the same, one patient may present very early in life, one patient may present very late in life. Um, urea cycle disorders, which I've spent a lot of time working with, the earliest patient presented at about 12 hours of age. My oldest patient was 85 years before they presented. Same disease, but just different presentations. 
So when you stretch that out across the lifespan, you can see a lot of different changes. The other thing is we don't know much about incidence. We don't have a great handle on how many of these conditions are. Probably the best data is coming out of newborn screening where we can uh, detect almost all of the patients. But for, other, for some of these conditions, we don't have screening. We just don't know. So we're making a lot of guesswork. We don't have a lot of outcome data. These patients, until recently, weren't even detected. So it's hard to know how do they do, how do they present, how do they go forward. We find in rare disease more than any other field of medicine that our patients and families are our best source of information. They're also our best partners in trying to understand what's going on. So we have to work. Not only is it the right thing to do, but we have to work with our patients and families to understand what's going on with these conditions. Rare disease patients see more specialists than any other field of medicine. I'll show you a little bit about that later on. But they see across the board more specialists, and their expenses are quite a bit greater. And we'll hear some more about that in one of our other talks. And care expertise is limited. Uh, there just aren't that many people taking care of these patients right now. Life expectancy is going up. So let's take Down syndrome as kind of a borderline rare disease. In the 1980s, life expectancy was in the 20s. It's now approaching 60 and going up a little bit every year. Same thing for cystic fibrosis. Same thing for sickle cell anemia. Some of this is because of new therapies that have been developed. Some of it is actually just getting organized, comparing, comparing best treatment guidelines, and then actually applying those to the patients. Cystic fibrosis is a great example of that. There's some wonderful new therapies, but actually just getting everybody on the same page and caring for those patients has had a tremendous impact on the outcome of these patients. Um, one of my wife's oldest patients now is a med school graduate, starting to take care of CF patients in her own practice. The other is evidence. So when we do regulatory work or we do papers on rare disease or we try to make decisions. You know, we love to grade things, particularly here in the U.S. So we have our A, B, C, and D evidence. A is meta-analysis of humongous studies across millions of patients. B is huge, um, you know, single studies, but with thousands and thousands of patients. We never get those in rare disease. C is published data on that. And usually there's an initial series on a rare disease, but after that, all, most of the papers, or at least a lot of them, are on exceptions to that original presentation. Very hard to make guidelines from that. We actually rely on D-level evidence, expert opinion, expert caregivers, um, for a lot of the evidence we use in how to treat these patients, how to develop care guidelines, things like that. Now, one thing you should definitely keep in mind, the model we're building in rare disease is going to impact general medicine. Here's why. With the advent of molecular testing and molecular diagnosis, cancer and many other fields are subdividing into smaller and smaller groups. A great example is breast cancer. There are over 30 molecular types of breast cancer. Each of those subtypes actually now gets different treatment regimens depending on the genetic test results from that. And we're going to see that more and more in mainstream medicine as we go forward. So a lot of the things we're developing in the rare disease field about how do we do things, how do we think of these things, is actually going to apply to mainstream medicine going forward. So let's talk a little bit about economics. So this is some data from 2017. The annual cost of caring for a rare disease patient runs around $97,000 per year um, in 2017 dollars, as opposed to about 12 or 13,000 for a non-rare disease. How relevant is it for a children's hospital? So we looked at about 1.5 million visits to our children's hospital here in Washington, D.C., Children's National, and we found if you went to a children's hospital once, there's about a 12 percent chance that you would be encoded as having a rare disease or an orphan disease. If you got admitted, it was almost a 20% chance that you had a rare disease. If you visited twice, even if you went in to get your ears checked or you, know, you had a cold or a cough, it was almost 30% chance that you had an orphan or rare disease. Uh, there's a great study from 2004 that showed 
almost 36% um, of the admitted patients in a children's hospital had a diagnosed genetic condition, but those patients accounted for almost 60% of the hospital bills. So huge impact on the economics in children's health care, particularly at children's hospitals. When we look at the number of specialists, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but our patients in rare disease see everybody. From neonatology onward, they see every medical specialty. We're probably a bigger user of medical specialties than any other field in pediatrics, and now we're seeing this in adult medicine too. What type of therapies are coming along? Well, we've got organ transplant, enzyme replacement, small molecules, substrates, enzymology, messenger RNA, which we just finished the giant experiment on after the uh, COVID pandemic. Gene therapy, I put quotes around that because gene therapy means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Gene correction, which is an oncoming field. I would say not quite here yet. Dietary manipulation, all of these have cost. And we'll talk about some of that going forward. So when we look at uh, drug approvals, this shows you some impact. Probably the Orphan Drug Act, which is in its 40th year this year, has been one of the most successful incentive programs in government history. About 1,078 orphan drug approvals have been awarded since 1983. Before that, there were probably maybe two or three a year, tops. So now, about 93 to 100 per year, and that's been a consistent number. That's um, 497 unique drugs, because some of them can be used for more than one disease. Now, here's the interesting, 50% of the new drugs approved each year by FDA are for orphan designations. So that means that of there's 100 drugs approved, 50 of them were for an orphan disease. About half of those are for rare cancers. Rare cancer is always going to be in that mix there. But the rest are for the huge number of 10,000 different conditions. So we're getting maybe 50 to 60 uh, knocked off each year where there's some form of therapy. They're not always curative, but they certainly are very helpful to these patients. And that's been a consistent number for the last five years. When we look at why has pharma been so incentives? Well, there's a number of incentives in the Orphan Drug Act. Uh, one is they can get some extended exclusivity uh, in the marketplace, a little extension on the patent. But the other is the success rate. Normally, a drug coming through the FDA process has about a 9.6 um, chance of making it all the way through. Orphan drugs have a 26% chance of making it all the way through. So the investments in those for these smaller populations are well incentivized, and that's one of the reasons we're seeing so many things come through the Orphan Drug Act. When we look at the cost, though, of bringing a drug through, it's still very, very high. Uh, it tends to run about 500 plus million to take a drug through all four, three phases, and then the post-marketing period of that. So these are one of the reasons these drugs end up being fairly expensive is because it costs so much to bring them through. It also takes longer. On average, about 6.7 years longer to get an orphan drug approved over a mainstream drug. Um, the other thing is you're doing it with about a half or the quarter of the patients that you would otherwise have for that study. So fewer patients, longer time, um, shorter time to recover cost, on a fewer number of patients, we call it the denominator problem. That's one of the reasons some of these drugs cost so much. Next. All right. Who takes care of these patients? Well, this is primarily a field of medical genetics. And when we look at medical genetics, we've got a, we've got a real shortage in workers here. So we've got about one geneticist for every quarter million people in the United States. And it gets less frequent from there. In Europe, it's about one in a million. Latin America, about one in a quarter million. Uh, in the rest of the world, it's about one in three to four million. So there's really not much coverage outside. Now, some of that reflects the clinical relevance. Rare disease, by and large, tends to be detected more in countries where there is a uh, low birth, um, death rate around birth and also where there is a lot of medical resource to actually detect these patients. So as that happens, you tend to get more medical geneticists. But still, we think what we need is about one in 100,000, something like that. So 
even here in the United States, but elsewhere in Europe and other places, we don't quite have the coverage we need. How do we navigate all these challenges? Well, one is we have to collaborate. We're in a field that forces collaboration because there are so few people in it, so many diseases, remember 10,000 plus, and new every week. We need new care models. We have to look at some of the old models, the old financial models, the old bring the patient in, have them sit in the waiting room coming in, and we've got to try new models. Telehealth is a big one. Digital health is huge in our field. Lots of new things to do. And then we have to use technology well. We have to allow the patients to get a lot of their data into us and back and forth um, with them so that we can all be really care partners for these rare diseases. Because as I said earlier, our patients and families often know a lot more about these conditions uh, than we do. And we have to start using our primary care providers better. Uh, there's been a real trend of pushing anything that was unusual towards medical specialists, specialists over the last 30, 40 years. We have to reverse that trend and get our primary care providers involved again. So there's a tsunami of information. We got choices. We can stay in our old boat down there in the trough, and we're going to get smashed if we do. Or we can really use a lot of the new technology, a lot of the new models, a lot of the things we're going to talk about in this series, um, get on our jet ski and see if we can't make it over the back end of the wave. So thank you very much. Thank you.